Are you thinking of selling your practice either soon or one day? Well, either way, you don't just wake up one day and stick a for sale sign in the window and good things happen. It doesn't work that way. You have to prepare. And my guest today helps dental practices prepare to sell, among other things that he does, and he's going to offer his advice. I'm Carl White, Principal at Mark Advisory Group, which is a healthcare marketing agency, and I'm also the host of Practice Care. And the mission for both is the same, and that's to help private practice owners stay private. Not only is that what they want, but let's face it, care is better when the provider owns the place and has the most freedom to make the clinical decisions they think are best. And my guest today is Rex Plamen. Rex is a tenured dental professional and a partner at DDS Match in Chicago. At DDS Match, Rex provides services focused on practice sales, associate recruitment, practice valuations, and the formation of mergers and partnerships. But before DDS Match, Rex served for over 25 years at a national dental distributor throughout the Midwest, long time in dental. Rex, thanks for coming on Practice Care. Hey, thank you so much, Carl, for having me. Yeah, it is great. I've been looking to this, looking forward to this one for a while. So let's jump right in. I'm curious, just kind of more background. Um, what got you into dental and what's kept you there for so long? It's a long time. Yeah, yeah. I've got to blame my father on that one. Yeah. Um, we all blame our fathers. <laughs> yeah, right. And, Mom gets uh, the God, glory, dad gets the blame, right? So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. God rest his soul. He got me into <laughs> dental back when I probably... Didn't know any better one way or another where I wanted to be. And uh, so that started in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I grew up. And he was working for that major distributor here in the U.S. Okay. And uh, so he got me into working not only for them, but he owned his own distributorship when I was a kid. And I was there helping fill orders, and wow. fill the UPS trucks. And so uh, before I even was out of high school, I started in dentistry. And uh, it got much more serious once I got out of college. Okay. And I figured out, hey, those territory reps at that distributor do pretty good. I was looking at their cars in the parking lot all uh -huh. the time. And I thought, yeah, maybe I'll do that instead of continuing on into law or anything else. So mm -hmm. um, that got me going back in 1993 as a territory rep for uh, the company was Patterson Dental. And I worked sure. a couple territories for them and eventually led a couple of their sales branches, which ultimately brought me here to Chicagoland about 17 years ago where I've started my family. And uh, that has progressed a whole lot as time is flying by. Um, but I guess I haven't left dentistry because uh, it is such a great industry. It's still really kind of a boutique industry. Um, there, there's so much to be done in this, in this marketplace, uh, depending on your skill sets. And it, it can be very rewarding. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I mean, so I go to my dentist twice a year unless something else comes up and without looking hard, there's some new little piece of tech somewhere in the office and none of the offices are terribly large. Like, Ooh, what's that? You know, it just, it just seems like the, the techno, the, the evolution of care or the advancements of tools and tech that are available just doesn't slow down. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. That was, that was tough to keep up with over at that distributor. Yeah. 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 yeah, lots of great tools. Yeah, and just the training must be unbelievable to keep up with it. So, a long and loyal uh, participant in the in, in the dental industry, that's you, and uh, yeah. no no end coming soon. So let's no, jump in. No. Yes, yeah, so let's jump in our topic. We're, topic we're talking about getting ready to sell your practice, and you know one of the things that people can kind of get focused in on themselves and on on what's in front of their face. But if you're selling, that means somebody has to buy it. So for those who are thinking of selling, in your experience, what do buyers want? Yeah, buyers buyers have a long list, a wish list, let's call it. And, and at the top is they're looking for a great location, you know, one that'll satisfy where they want to be in a certain community. Okay. Um, that's that's definitely probably one. And they're thinking of their commute from where they maybe already established themselves. Okay. Uh, so like location's a big point. Um, mm -hmm. They want to see clean financials too, Carl. You know, when they're inspecting a dental practice that's for sale, they want to know that they're, that they're dealing with somebody that's being pretty transparent with their financials, their production, and what's going on in that practice. Um, so that's another key ingredient. They want to see some technology. You mm. know, a lot of the, the folks that are coming out of dental school or have been out of dental school for the last 10 years, those are, those are 
the cream of the crop for those that are looking to buy. And they, they want to see that the practice is digitized and hopefully chartless. Um, and unfortunately mm. we don't always see that with our, our aging dentists that are looking to, yeah to, um, you know, go, go off into their retirement phase of life. And okay, uh, you want to tidy up the house too, right? When you're getting ready to sell your, your home to somebody else that's maybe moving into your neighborhood, you obviously are touching things up and polishing things. And, and uh, it should be the same way when you're selling your dental practice. Um, put true. yourselves in the eye of a patient, basically, and say, you know, what looks a little untidy? What could be cleaned up a little bit? What could mm -hmm. organize us better as we prepare to sell our practice? Is there like a staging version? So we sold our house, I don't know, nine or 10 years ago. And I felt like I was living in a museum for about six weeks. I was afraid to sit anywhere, touch anything, do anything. It was all staged. And that was supposed to, is there, is there an equivalent to that? And when you're selling there a practice, is, but there isn't because obviously this is a working business that's getting ready to sell. And yeah. so you can't help but have, you know, some of the um, untidiness that might occur when you're seeing patients on a regular basis. And, and buyers certainly understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They expect some clutter. Right. You know? So you said clean financials. What, what came to my mind is how do you, how do you verify that? Right. Because um, it's in the world of due diligence and, the, the the seller wants to put their best, you know, story forward, I guess, the best picture forward. And they have to tell you some things, but maybe not every like how do you know as a buyer, you know, all right, now I'm seeing the clean, now I'm getting the full story. Like, how do you I, I, I gotta imagine there's some resistance, you know, sure. to, to not not sure. show the bad stuff. So how do you get through that? Yeah. And and when I think of buyers, you know, a, a seller should really be be putting their arms around mitigating risk for the buyers that are coming to the table that are that are taking a peek behind the dashboard mm -hmm. um, of what's going on there or under the hood, looking under the hood. So um, you, you want to know that, hey, they want to see that production numbers and collection numbers are lining up on their profit and loss statement, which is then lining up with their tax returns as well. Mm. And and if we've got that, that's that's very consistent across the board from those different documents, then we're going to be presenting a pretty clean practice. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In your experience, I think about, you know, sellers, everybody, I'm going to sell and I'm, I'm going to sell it for X amount of money. And, and I've talked to a few people in the course of doing this podcast and just being in the healthcare world for a while. And one of the themes that comes through to me, at least, is maybe it's just more in the medical dental healthcare space, but they kind of throw a number on there. It's sort of comes out of nowhere. They get very anchored on it. And then 99 times out of a hundred, they end up getting disappointed because then what it's really worth starts to set in and it causes some, some issues. So as a preamble you know, the, the, I'm wondering in your experience, what separates the sellers who get a good price from the sellers who don't? And I know there's there's the things that you just said. Obviously, you got to have clean financials. You got to be up to date. The things that you just said, but there's more to it. Maybe it's like what other factors in your experience, you know, get a good price from the seller's point of view versus those who end up disappointed. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it starts with location. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the trends today with buyers is they don't want to get too far from city centers. You know, they don't want to be necessarily out in the farm country, unfortunately, where there's plenty of money to be made. And some of those those practices out there are the best of the bunch. Um, so it starts with location. It, it starts with, you know, having a little bit of the technology that's available today in the practice. Uh, so we're not looking like we're archaic or mm -hmm. some sort of dinosaur that's that's moving off. Um, those those are two things. Location, having some technology having a strong team around you. Um, folks mm. want to know today because it's so hard to recruit good employees that that this practice I'm looking at to buy has a really strong team already and they're willing to stay on board mm -hmm. uh, through the transition and, and their post-sale as well. Um, so that's a big deal. And, you know, you talked a little bit at the beginning there, uh, Carl, about, you know, sort of the expectations for pricing the practice to the market. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's where things can really be disaligned in the beginning or or off kilter a little bit uh, where the seller thinks, hey, I'm just going to sell it for this much. This is what I want for the practice, Rex. And I've got to have a heart to heart discussion with them about what the market will bear. 
and um, and there there's just certain price points that occur because of the financials that we we can't get ourselves around. Mm -hmm. And 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 ultimately, you know, you could go down that path with a a practice that's not priced right and bring some buyers in, and at the last minute, they might realize that they're getting scammed, maybe. And, and they start looking in another direction and, and ghost us. Um, so we, we certainly have to understand where the market is, where this practice lies in the market. A lot of it has to do with cash flow in the practice or net income mm -hmm. and, and price it right from there. And we do so, we feel better than anybody on the planet with a, uh, an accounting firm called Blue and Company that does about 400 um, evaluations of practices a year for us. Okay. Mm -hmm. How often would you say, like for every 10 dentists who contact you say, let's, let's go down this path, want to sell. I'm curious, like what proportion of them on average have a number that's just not, you know, where you need to have that heart to heart. I'd say 20 to 30%, Carl. Wow. Yeah. I was, yeah. I was expecting you to say a higher number. I don't know why I just thought. Yeah. And maybe I'm being nice, but you know, <laughs> many people have their, have themselves aligned and, and, and they'll trust, you know, where we're coming back with figures and talk that through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the other 70, 80%, they say, you know, I'm thinking of a number here and you go, yeah, that feels reasonable. Yeah, that feels reasonable. And then we'll truly know after we dive into all the documents and have our accounting team review it. And they'll come back with some questions to uncover some, some holes, may, maybe in the financials. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's about right. Carmen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, these questions, again, I think I said this before, these questions might sound repetitive, but tend to, it's like peeling an onion, I guess. Um, if, if, a, if a dental practice owner or a dentist kind of cornered you somewhere and said, all right, what, what are the must do's? If I don't do the, these two or three things, I'm never going to sell this practice uh, or certainly not for anywhere near what I would like to get for it. Like if you don't have these things in place, forget it, buddy. What would you say those absolutely must haves are? Yeah, I would start with, you know, they've that they have a hundred percent comfort with selling and moving on to another stage. And that doesn't mean that you're getting out of dentistry. You you might go serve at a university to teach, mm -hmm. you might work at a county free clinic and, and volunteer your time in dentistry, but you gotta be a hundred percent prepared to say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna put the for sale sign out. We're going to start attracting buyers. And in 90 days, we could be entertaining a letter of intent and start going down the path to closing. Or it could happen in a, in a year or so. Um, another piece, another piece to that is um, really knowing that you can afford to retire. That mm. your, your wealth strategies have worked for you. You've got the appropriate dollars in the bank to lead you in the right direction towards your retirement and the next stage of life. So the money's in the bank and you've talked to your financial planner about it and you've done so with a realistic number number for what the practice would sell for. Mm -hmm. Those are two points that are, are pretty big. Right, so um, mindset and personal life, kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. most, definitely, most yeah. definitely. And our approach is to align with their goals. So if they wanna spend more time with their grandkids, if they'd like to move to another state, I'm gonna ask them when they wanna do that to be happy. And then I'm going to formulate a plan to get them there. Right, right. What are the most common mistakes you see sellers make? Yeah. Because like uh, you, you can't can. correct for your geography, right? I mean, you are where you are. Right, um, right. I don't know. You can, I guess you can screw up, wrong word, but you could be old style and have the wrong systems and things. But are there, you know, like just really common mistakes you see, whether they're obvious or, I mean, not obvious? I know people won't see this, but I wrote it down on a little blackboard so, here. So I'll read it. Confidentiality, clean financials, expectations, growth. So go through those. Yeah. So first and foremost, it's really important to keep confidentiality as you're preparing to sell your practice and you have your practice out on the marketplace. Um, a lot of owners will feel guilty and want to tell their team that they're preparing to sell their practice. And I've, I've been doing this for about six years now. And those are probably the biggest mistakes we can make is uncovering what we're doing to our team and our patients. Um, unfortunately, Carl, I've seen a couple 
transitions go really bad because the doctor owner opened the door to his team that here's what I'm thinking of doing. I'm preparing to sell. And the next thing they know, their staff's walking out the door because they don't know about their future anymore. Yeah. And and they get really nervous. They get happy feet, as I call it. <laughs> and they go find another job somewhere. Even though, you know, it, the, the seller probably didn't get the chance to tell them this in the right way. They're probably the second biggest asset in a sale to the patient base. Yeah. So keeping confidentiality is huge. Okay. Um. You know, as we talked about earlier, having clean financials and understanding that, you know, the broker that you're hiring to get the job done for you to sell your practice is going to need clean financials from the get go mm -hmm. to price it right and to be able to support the sale price when the buyers start looking at the practice. So clean mm -hmm. financials is big. Having having sound expectations uh, with what the market will bear. Um, that's another big one. Um, if I don't have alignment with a, a seller from the beginning, as we're getting to know each other and talking about partnering in their project, and they they want to sell their practice for a million dollars, but I know it's only going to go for five to six hundred thousand. If we can't come together on that, I can't work with that that client. Sure. Um, and and we're just going to waste time, right? You've you've seen it with a house on your block or in your neighborhood that is just sitting there for sale forever. And you know, houses are moving at a certain rate yeah. and this one's not going anywhere. And you look at the price and it's at 899,000 and you know, it should be 799 and it's just going to sit there until they get down to 799. Yeah. 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 So those are, those are the top three. And then the other one is, is growth. Um, many practitioners will start to get towards, a timeline where they're thinking about retiring and selling their practice. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, they decide, you know what, I'm going to cut back a day. I'm going to cut back a day. I'm going to turn off the marketing for new patients. And those are two things that are really going to hurt when it comes time to sell your practice. So not only have you, because just say it's, fewer patients means less revenue, that simple. Yeah, basically. And, and the and the new buyer coming in, if they don't see a new patient flow, they're going to wonder if they can attract new patients to grow it from where they're purchasing it. Because mm -hmm. there's no guarantee that there's patients available. Right. Um, new patients available. So um, oftentimes folks talk about, I'm going to go from four days to three days. And that, that day that you cut out is worth $150,000 in collections annually. So not only are you, if you have a 70% overhead, let's say you're, you're cutting $45,000 from your income annually when you cut out that day. Mm -hmm. And then that $150,000, if sold at 70% of collections, let's say uh, sometime down the road, that's going to cost you $105,000 in the sale of your practice. And so if you've cut back a day for the last couple of years, it's cost you $200,000 in those two years to get that mm. day free. So is that really worth it? So you got to try and stay in growth mode, at least keep consistent with where you've been in production mm -hmm. and attracting new patients to the practice. Um, and, and that's a big pitfall to avoid. Got it. Okay. Yeah. They're acting like they're winding it down, but they really want to sell it, which the buyer doesn't want something that's winding down. They want something that's vibrant. Yeah. And when we value a practice and when buyers evaluate a practice, they're really looking hard at the last year more than any other year in the timeline of the business. Really? Why is that? Just because that's the most relevant time period of okay. the production, capacity, and profitability of the practice. Got it. Okay. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, so we could talk a long time about this, uh, but in the interest of more bite-sized advice here on practice care, two wrap-up questions I ask every guest. The first is, in the context of what we're talking about prepping, you know, getting ready to sell your practice, is there anything you think I should have asked you but did not? Yeah. Um, you got to make sure everybody's aligned that's close to you. So... It's good to run this by your spouse or significant other and, and make sure this is the right timing. Oftentimes, we don't have to worry about that because the spouse is trying to get the client, yeah. the practice owner, to retire. Yeah. And uh, they just don't want to do it. So you got to have some alignment there mm -hmm. uh, with your timelines, with the significant others in your in your life. Um, that's one thing that comes to mind, Carl. Okay. Um, 
And then, you know, there's, there's a lot of folks that consider trying to sell their practice on their own. Mm -hmm. And I would just ask that practice owner who's thinking of that, have you ever sold your own house on your own? Mm -hmm. And, and many have not, many Mm -hmm. have not, most probably haven't. And, and it's more complicated to sell a practice. There's a lot of moving parts. There's deep due diligence and there's a lot of, you know, uh, what we'll call usual and customary that that both sides are used to attorneys and accountants and folks like ourselves and somebody selling their practice for the first time just might not be aligned right Mm -hmm. um, with with the parameters and selling a practice. And you'll scare off some good buyers um, by the time maybe you realize you need to adjust. Yeah. And I imagine they do that. Why? Because they they want to save some money on whatever it costs to hire you. Just look at what you're getting for that. Yes, it's a number. It's true. But, you know, how often would you advise somebody to do something so complicated on their own for the first time? You know? Yeah. And I'd like to think that, you know, we're going to treat everybody fairly in these uh, negotiations. And in a competitive situation, your broker should be able to keep your price right or even move the price up with the competitive spirits around multiple buyers at the same time coming to work with that practice. Sure. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. I wonder, have you had a, going back to your first one, have you had any situations where Dr. Dentist X is looking to sell, but then, you know, the rest of the family goes, wait a second, what, what are you doing? And it kind of just causes pain, friction, blows it up. Yeah, I, I had that with a gentleman um, a few years back when I was just getting going. Uh, he, he thought he was ready to sell, but his spouse didn't want him to sell. And she wanted to keep him working. And he was telling me as he fessed up a little while after that, that uh, she wanted to make sure there was enough spending money there for her shopping habits and, and entertainment that she enjoyed. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is what it so is. Definitely happened. Is what it is. All right. Um, and the other question I ask is, so we've caught a listener's attention. They've been toying with the idea of selling, you know, I've been talking about this. I really should do this. Um, what are the one or two tangible steps you would advise that listener to take? You know, it could be something simple, whatever it is to get started down the path. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would check with your financial advisor or your accountant to make sure the numbers are right to carry you forward without practice ownership. Okay. Um, you know, maybe it's not retirement as you're considering selling your practice. Maybe you just don't want to manage the practice. This really isn't for those folks. This is more for those that are looking to retire from dentistry, that you just got to make sure all the numbers are right and and uh, and, mm-hmm. and take that piece first to make sure you'll be comfortable post-sale with your finances. Yeah. Um, secondly, I would I would definitely take a look around the marketplace to see who you should be networking with that you can trust um, to help you sell your practice. To align like somebody like myself, a broker out there who specializes in selling dental practices, before you're ready to sell, it's great to have a conversation like we've had to talk about where you could be preparing mm-hmm. and what are the timelines that are that are gonna be good for your goals. Um, cause if you, if you come to your broker and say, I want to put the practice up today and I want to be done and sold in six months, that's going to be really hard to do. Yeah. Um, uh, because the, the average practice sells in seven to nine months, it can certainly sell in 120 days, but it could also take more than a year. Mm-hmm. Um, so make sure you've got the right timeline going for you to prepare and get it to the marketplace. And you know what? You sparked another question. So, you know, you were talking about networking, find people you can trust. So everybody's got an accountant, but let me ask you, um, is every accountant out there the one you want to help you sell versus do your taxes and other sort of ad hoc advice? Same with maybe your attorney, like your dream team, you know, like you're you're a pure yeah. play dental broker, right? You make sense. Um, right, right. But just because you're an accountant, maybe you'll tell me, yeah, they're fine. What's needed is fine, but I'm curious. Or should you just presume that your current team who's helping you maintain your business is the same team that should help you sell it? Yeah, and if if you have the right accountant, they've been helping you to manage your business, keep your finances clean, 
talk to you about your profit and loss and what's going on with your expenses throughout the time period of ownership of your practice. And when it comes to selling, hopefully we don't have to lean on them too much. Okay. Uh, we, we just want to request from them all the prepared documents or get some up-to-date documents to help sell the practice. And if they can provide those, hopefully that's all we need from them. Okay. Um, yeah. But along the way, I do feel like dental practices should employ an accountant who is very familiar with the dental industry and dental practices sure. in general. Yeah. Sure. And, and certainly when it comes to attorneys, Carl, you mentioned that. Yeah. Um, uh, it's really good to have an attorney when it comes time to sell the practice. And, and we're going to engage that attorney after an LOI has been served and agree upon by the buyer and seller. Now it's time to go, okay, uh, Dr. Seller, let's go get your attorney ready. Uh, they've done dental practice sales, right? And, and if they say no, I'll give them two or three names of folks that I trust that'll get the job done that mm -hmm. won't be trying to ring up the, the hourly um, needed to get the job done. So uh, that's a critical team player as you yeah. mentioned there to have on board. Yeah. Um, excellent. Thank you, Rex. Uh, really insightful. Hopefully this has uh, got under some people's skin in a good way and it'll help them steer them down a good path compared to the path they might've been taking. Um, Really appreciate your time. Thanks again for coming on. Yeah, my pleasure to be a part of this, Carl. I, I thank you so much for inviting me to the podcast. With pleasure. So once again, Rex Plowman is with DDS Match. And Rex, we're going to put all your contact information that you gave me into the show notes for your episode so that anyone who wants to get a hold of you can do so really easily. Um, and a couple of other points before we wrap up. First, if you own a practice, whether it's dental, medical, anywhere in the healthcare world, and you've got an experience or some experience on the business side of practice that you think others like you would benefit from, or if you're someone like Rex or I who seeks to serve private practices and you've got some experience that you want to share to help private practice owners, either way, we want you to come on Practice Care and tell the world about it. In the, ep in the show notes for Rex's episode and every episode, there's a link, a couple of questions. Tell us what's on your mind so that we can get you scheduled as soon as possible. And finally, if you haven't done so yet, please subscribe to Practice Care on Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon, Stitcher. We're on all the major platforms. Subscribe so that when every episode drops once a week, you can stay up to date. Thanks very much. And until next time.